Hello and welcome to the Real Estate Investing Roundtable. This is where we have real unfiltered interviews with real investors that are currently in the real estate business. I'm your host, Rob the House Guy, and today we are super excited to have two powerhouses in our industry right here with us on the show. Now, normally we have investors, and yes, they are both investors, but today they have their legal hats on. They are attorneys, and we're going to be talking all about wholesaling. So welcome, Jeff Watson, and welcome, Angelo Russo. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right. So we all know that wholesaling is a buzzword on the internet, at all the RIA meetings, anywhere you go. Heck, all these weekend classes are blowing through town charging thousands of dollars. It's all based on wholesaling. But let's start by asking a legal opinion. What is wholesaling to you, Jeff? Wholesaling is when an individual buys a property at a low price because they're able to pay, fund it quickly, close, pay cash, and then they quickly resell it to a buyer who's willing to pay more, probably to a rehabber or a landlord or somebody like that. But to me, wholesaling done properly is buy it, take title, and resell. Same day, next day, next week, next month. Doesn't matter. Gotcha. Angelo? I would agree with that, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're buying it low. You're just buying the property and you're buying them in bulk. Gotcha. Okay. So we are there looking- There you go. Yeah. So I, I believe what I hear you saying here is closing and taking title, which is completely contradicting what all of the gurus out there are talking about with assigning a contract. What does assigning a contract mean to you? Okay. So assigning a contract is on occasion permitted and legal. You know, remember, you gotta, I'm coming at it from the perspective of working with regulators in multiple states all across the United States of America on what is wholesaling, how it's regulated, how it's defined. Assigning a contract means that I've contracted to buy a property. I have the ability and capacity to perform as a party to that contract. But then I choose to assign that contract because maybe my rehab crew's tied up and Angelo's crew's free to go. So I'm able to kick that thing over to him and he'll give me a small assignment fee for it. That is an assignment that is done properly and legally. Okay. So when you're coming across, you've been involved in title companies before. Yes. When you see assignments coming through the, the filter there, do you see any problems with them usually? Or what's one of the big hiccups that you see in the assignments? People are not able to actually perform on it or don't have the intention of performing on it. That usually causes an issue or they don't want to be paid on the closing statement or they want that hidden. They don't want someone to know how much they're making. All of that stuff is disclosed. People need to know what's going on. You have to have transparency. Transparency is yes. the word. I, I always, love that. He's I, so right. He's I so right. I always say that. Because people always are asking me questions about that in a real estate deal. Like, was well, this wrong? And they always ask me, they go, I need an investor friendly title company. That's, I've been no, asked that. No, 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 no. <laughs> Just do your deal right. Any title company can close it. I say that all the time. I'm like, well, unless you're committing fraud, they're all investor friendly, unless you're looking for someone that's going to let you do something illegal. So, what they say, when what I read when they say investor friendly, when I see that, because I see it all the time, social media, everywhere else, is I don't know what I'm doing. Please tell me a name of a title company that can help me finish my, my own deal. <laughs> I'm going to use that as my answer all the time, and I may give you credit for it. Because that, that is the truth. That's exactly it. I need someone that's going to handle this deal for me and get me paid. Because I don't know what I'm doing. Exactly. Which means I haven't educated myself, which means I haven't plugged into the training that's available through RealFlow and other places to see how I really do this. Right. I get lots of weird questions. Someone says, I have my trust that's supposed to be purchasing the property, and we're going to be assigning it, but I want the check from the title company to go to this LLC. I'm like, that's not going to work. That's right. It won't work. It's not. Yeah. I'm like, well, we need an, a friendly, you know, title company that will do that. I'm like, if they do it, they should be closed down relatively soon. Yes, <laughs> he's right. Well, I believe what people need to realize is a title company. They are not just cowboys out there able to do anything they want. They have a title insurance company that is underwriting them and auditing what they do. So when their files are all messed up. Title companies disappear. <laughs> they do. They, they, can, they can disappear, but every title company that's out there, like you said, they're owned or governed by one or more major underwriters, and they have all these underwriting bulletins and guidelines that they have to follow if they want to stay in business, keep their license, and not go to jail. And so you've got to figure out as an investor, how do I structure my deals to A, be legal, and B, write it down to where the title company can read the paperwork and figure out what's happening and then get it done. I usually tell people on top of being legal, 
the underwriters sometimes have their own guidelines. So if you come to me and say, can you do something that's legal? Yes, but that doesn't mean that the underwriter is going to approve it. And since they're on the hook and they're insuring it, you also have to make them happy, which might be above and beyond what's legal. Exactly. Well put. All right. We used a word a couple minutes ago called intent. Mm, so, and capacity. Yes. <laughs> intent and capacity. Yes. Could you expand on that intent and capacity, what that would mean to somebody? Well, let me step back one thing before we get there, okay? If your marketing message is, I buy houses, I pay cash, I close quickly, then flip and do it. <laughs> buy the house, pay cash, and close, okay? Because if your marketing message is, I buy houses, I pay cash, I close quickly, and every deal you do is an assignment, well, you're a fraud. Right. Okay, you're engaged in a fraudulent activity on a regular basis, and look out, Uncle Rico may come visit. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I don't want to. I want to scare people, but I want them to realize there's a legitimate, easy way to do this. So you have to have the intent and capacity. That does that mean you have to perform on every deal? No. When you put a property under contract, it's like if it passes my inspection criteria, I've got the money and I can close. Now, well, wait a second, Jeff. I don't have the money in my own bank account. Great. Do you have a private lender or two lined up? How about a hard money source? How about dough for a day? Do you have a couple of them lined up that have said, listen, you get something that fits this criteria, we'll fund it. Okay, then you now have capacity to perform. So it sounds to me like it's not even a problem with just the division of real estate. It could be Department of Commerce with misleading advertising at that point that could lend you in hot water. In Ohio, the division of real estate is under the Department of Commerce. Oh, okay, yeah. and so I've, I've had the opportunity to work with the excellent fine people down there, the state of Ohio Division of Real Estate, and they've been leading the charge across the United States of America. Some of the people there in Columbus have been influencing policy across the nation for the last several years, particularly when it comes to wholesaling and how it's viewed and how it's regulated and how it's interpreted. And I've had, um, I've had conversations with them where they're like, Wholesaling in their eyes is assignments and it bothers them. But when you buy it, take title, and then resell, they're like, well, you're a flipper, that's fine. Gotcha. Now, we also mentioned in their disclosure and transparency. So, as I, it used to be, I've been doing this since the mid 90s, and it used to be that if you were assigning a contract, you just had to pick one person that knew how much you were making on your assignment. Which side of the HUD do you want to be on on your assignment? You have to pick one or the other. Now it seems that everybody has to know. What, what have you seen? Most of the time I like if the buyer and the seller see both sides of the HUDs, but even on retail transactions, sometimes that doesn't happen. Most realtors will ask that you know, both parties sign off so they can see exactly that the fees are split the correct way. But the buyer or the seller is not entitled to see the other side other than to make sure that it's done right. And since the title company is an unbiased third party, you can sort of assume that they're doing things the way that they're supposed to. Now, we've talked a lot about assignments of contract here. And the second question that always pops up, at least in the state, and I deal primarily in the state of Ohio probably 99% of the time, is people ask me about double closes. Mm. <laughs> double closes. And so you start out, tell me, what is a double close? You're buying the property and then you're reselling it. It might be a minute later, it might be a day later, it might be two days later. But uh, the thing that usually gets most people are they're trying to use the money that they're making from the second closing to finance the first one, and you cannot do that. That is what is called a dry first closing, and that's a no-no. The double closings are perfectly legit, but they have to be independent, standalone transactions, each one standing on its own merits. They can be two minutes apart, they can be two hours apart, two days apart, but they gotta be able to stand alone. So taking the money from the C buyer and bringing it over into the A to B transaction is a no-no. It's a no-no legally or ethically or both? <laughs> it is a no-no. Well, I'm going to speak to it my side, and then Angelo's going to fill this in because I, I won't hit it all. It's a no-no as to the underwriting guidelines issued by all the title insurance, uh, title insurance carriers. It's a no-no as it relates to your not being candid with the parties in the transaction. So you've got, a, you've got a fraudulent misrepresentation there as well. Those are the two things I've got. I'm sure you can fill in more. It, I would say years and years ago, a lot of times, the C buyer might even sign off allowing you to do that if they know they're, they're doing that. And now you've gotten rid of the transparency, but again, you're going above and beyond where the underwriters are saying, we don't want to see that. On top right. of that, if the C buyer knows that you're doing that, do an assignment. There's no reason to right. maybe do the double close. Exactly, well said. Now, we're focusing a lot on these assignments of contracts and these double closes 
and just assuming that these are all cash transactions. What happens when there's a bank or lending institution involved trying to do an assignment or double close? Well, double close will just take off the table at this point. Well, hang on a second. If my end buyer is getting institutional financing and I've taken the deal down and it takes them two weeks to come back in, that's fine. Nope, not a problem there. As long as the property is gonna be worthy of being collateral to an institutional lender. Lenders have a hard time with a lot of times with that and in their instructions, they're, at least they used to, I haven't read one in the last maybe few months, but they're always saying, if a closing has occurred within the last 90 days, you need to notify us before you fund it. So even though you're allowed to do it, they need to notify about it. Right. And anything that you're paying above and beyond, if it's an assignment, that money for the assignment generally isn't on the sale price of the house. And so your financing is going to be based on what your purchase contract is. So if you're buying it for 100 and you're signing it for five, 10,000, it's not that you're buying it for 110. The financing is gonna be based on the 100. Right. It, yeah. And so then that extra money that's not coming from the lender has got to be disclosed on the HUD. And I tell people to you know, show it as a POC paid outside of closing as buyer's additional basis. And because that buyer needs to have it tracked as to it's their basis. And I realize we're getting down into a real deep rabbit hole here. Mm -hmm. But from a tax perspective, I want my buyer who's ended up taking title and holding the thing, I want to be clear as to how, how big their basis is in the property. Wow, Jeff, that's really, really great stuff. And I understand it because I've been doing this for 22 years. But I'm going to guess that some of the people watching this haven't been doing it. They're trying to get their first deal off the ground. And we have just completely scared them out of ever even getting involved in real estate with how deep we just went. <laughs> okay. So let's let's okay. just simplify it and bring it all down here. and Back up out of the rabbit back hole. Back up out of the rabbit hole. Let's go down to that one simple piece of paper and talk about let's bring a deal in. You have new guy or girl walking into Bob or Betty homeowner and buying the house. What should be on their contract? Is there anything special that should be on the purchase agreement? Angelo, I'll let you speak to that. You need the, the name of the buyer, name of the seller, the property, the price. It's nice to have a closing date. Um, you should have your property disclosures, but that's more of the state requirement as opposed to a contract requirement, lead paint disclosure. I've always said with a lot of wholesalers or a lot of investors when they're buying things, they don't always use the disclosures, which has minor repercussions, but the deal can still go through. Angelo's exactly right. It has some repercussions. I'd rather see them there. And then the last thing is, in all the things he listed, the other thing I would say is on that one page or page and a half purchase and sales agreement, identify the title company. Complete, complete contact information of the title company, and the investor buyer needs to pick and control that from inception, and don't back off, don't waver on that. And it's not so much that you want investor friendly, but you want someone you have a relationship with. So when you're calling, trying to get updates, trying to find information, they actually return a call. Right. I'm on a deal now that I'm having that difficulty. Yep. Another great piece of advice is to put all the contact information for the buyer and seller. It drives title companies. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, because here's this goes back to a point I think we made earlier. Write that purchase and sales agreement so that some third party who's not been privy to any of the conversations, the negotiations, the marketing, doesn't anything, they can look at that contract and go, oh, Bill and Susan are selling to Ed. Right. Ed's company is this. Ed's phone number is this. Bill and Susan live here. Their phone number is this. We're going to use XYZ title company. We're going to close on the 31st of July. We're done. It's an instruction manual. Yes. That's all it is. And if you're adding things to that, the, the last payoff or the last mortgage statement from the sellers included in there. It has the contact information oh, yeah. for the bank. It has the loan number on there. It helps the title company tremendously in order to get that payoff and speed things up. Maybe. That is brilliant. And how about an authorization release on there? So release well, title company will take care of getting that. But at least if you have the statement, it starts the process. They know who to put on the authorization and you know who to address it to. And just to button the deal up just a little bit tighter, going back to a point Angelo made, because it's so easy to get them off the internet, Go ahead, get the lead-based paint disclosure on there. Go ahead, get the residential real property disclosure on there. Because if for some reason you're not going to be able to close on this deal and you're going to assign it, I want you to have a buttoned-up contract that when you assign it to somebody else, there's no wiggle room out of it. What are your thoughts on the buyer's name, you know, Joe Smith, slash, and or assigns? Is it necessary, not necessary? In practice, most people want to, the seller to actually sign off on that either way. So if the seller is going to be signing off on it, you, you can do it as an addendum afterwards. 
I think putting it on there actually just lets the seller know that you're probably going to have that option open to you. But I think it depends on your business model. Are you assigning a lot of these? Or is it just standard practice? I can tell you, I write it on my contracts, and I don't think I've ever signed one. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'll, I go one little step further, and, you know, it's, you know, name Joe Blow home buyer and or affiliated entities or assigns. Ah. Because I may not know which LLC or trust, uh, title holding trust, I'm going to drop this thing into. So I'm just going to leave myself that wiggle room right at the beginning of the contract. But like Angelo said, the seller's going to have to sign off on that assignment later on. So I like that. I'll tell you what, I'm learning from you guys. I do this all the time, full-time business, and I'm and the affiliated businesses, because I always just explain to myself, I was like, I may just, and a lot of times I do, take it into a different entity than what I signed. Because you're making decisions if you're going to sell the entity later or how you, if you're going to hold it or resell or whatever. I do that for the commercial properties, the larger buildings, a lot more often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, guys, this was really great. And I was really hoping to get through this all in one episode. But clearly this is a deeper topic than what I had anticipated. Is it possible that I could get you guys to stick around and we can shoot a second episode for next week that our viewers can watch to wrap this whole thing up? As long as I keep running the meter, I'm good. All right, we're going to turn the meter off between now and next week, but we'll bring it back for the episode. <laughs> <laughs> Works for me. All right, this is perfect. So we have to get back into covering transactional funding and, and covering um, how to market the property once you get under contract and actually getting it closed and uh, bring the whole thing to get the people paid. So this has been the Real Estate Investing Roundtable, and I really thank Jeff Watson and Angela Russo for being here. I'm your host, Rob the House Guy, and we will see you with part two to wholesaling next week. Remember, nothing works unless you do. Yeah.